Messi. Oh, what a goal oh, that is! Hi, I'm Scott Olerenshaw here, technical director for Sabah FC. Welcome to the Bola Bola Show. Hello and welcome to the Bola Bola Show. And we have another episode on air today. And, you know, as usual with me, the two usual suspects, my partners in crime, Steven and Bala. So how is it going, Bala? Oh, good, Alvin. Uh, crime is not very much. Crime is on for the social distance. Crime is not doing anything against the current event. So let's uh, hope this thing ends. And uh, besides that, everything is fine. And uh, yes, Steven, I'm sure you have a great story as well. Nothing much, guys. Still working from home as usual. And of course, uh, you know, num- numbers numbers are getting crazy, going up and down. So yeah, to all our listeners out there, you know, we, we all need to do play in our part, you know, trying to bring this down so that we can enjoy life as, as normal. But for the time being, you know, the best we can give to everybody out there is a podcast to listen. So again, mm-hmm. we have a very, very interesting episode this week. Who do we have on board, Elwin? So, in fact, today, you know, uh, for all our listeners, we are going to East Malaysia. We are going to the other side of the South China Sea, guys. Yep. yep. Right? To Negeri di Bawah Bayu. Sabah. Uh, uh, Negeri di Bawah Bayu is Sabah indeed. So, we want to talk about Sabah football. And, of course, you know, we have a Sabah legend on our show. But but before, you know, before we get to him, you know, let's uh, let's... Have a have a chat first about our Saba and football and all this. Also, so what? So what? What do you guys remember about the Saba team in the nineties, especially? For me, but uh, if I may, if I may start, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Bala. Saba basically a team. I think always interesting with the players, and I think they are more reminder of of athleticism. They are fast. They are very attacking, and they we, we use this Saba in the Padang, right? It's uh, Sabahan. The play. Sabahan they're very, guys. Yes, they're <laughs> very fit and they are very strong. They play in the mud and they're very brutal. Brutal in terms of they're very really attacker, mm-hmm. very passionate. So that's what the, the that's what feeling, you know. Uh, that's why how they play. So I think Sabah which brings a unique uh, ingredient, if I might say, to the Malaysian league actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. I agree, Bala. You know, because uh, mm-hmm. you look at the Sabah team from the nineties, it was a very, very attacking side, very in, uh, entertaining side to watch. With all the you know the, the names such as uh, what Harun Laban, mm. I think Bobby Chua, and yep. you know, we, I think we had uh, of course we had uh, Yap Wailun, Carlos Man, and goalkeeper. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I mean, who else you can remember, guys? Of course, uh, we you know the, the the man that we interviewed, Matlan Marjan. Yes, that yeah, guy, that legendary legendary figure from and, Malaysian football. And 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 of course also you know the guy that we are going to interview after this. But but before we mention his name, you know there's also for me I remember the Sabah team for this very creative playmaker in Seslija Milomir. I oh, I yeah oh, yeah that that the, the, I mean. For 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 a player playing in that position, you know, and having and he was quite a tall guy, isn't? No, no, no. Normally, you don't really see uh, very tall playmakers out there. You see, like like, but but but, you know, Seslija Minome is definitely one character that I remember very very well. In yeah. The, in 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 the nineties, and of course, guys, you know, one more thing about Sabah football is the the daytime football. You know. Because yeah, of the, the non floodlight football that we used to get the Malaysian League, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. This was way before when they, I mean, of course, before they moved into Lika Stadium. Yes. Like one year they moved in. But they used to play in the stadium called Penampang Stadium. Yes. Yeah. And anyway, it's, uh, it's very. Um, the 4 45 p.m. kickoff, you know. Yeah, it's 4 45 p.m. And then, you know, the stadium, you know, it wasn't really that extravaganza kind of mm-hmm. thing. It was a very, I think, simple ground. You know, it's, yeah. almost, it's almost like a community ground. You know, people. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, I personally never been there. I don't know about you, Elvin. With during mm-hmm. since you go back to Penampang quite often. Yeah, uh, yeah. By the, by the way, everyone, he's married to a Sabahan, so you know, mm-hmm. we are partially speaking about him as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, 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 yeah. Indeed, you know, the Sabah and 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 those daytime football, the the passion from from the people around there, all those kampung kids and all that, all. But you know. There is one guy, guys. You know, you, 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 We mentioned all the names, but let's 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 bring this guy out now. So, the guest on our show today, guys, is none other than Mr. Scott Olerenshaw. Wow, yeah, yeah. 
tr- tr- truly an honor to be able to talk to Scott. Uh, of course, you know, we all grew up watching him playing. Uh, Tremere, what an amazing player he was for Sabah yeah. back then. I mean, one of the one of the most important figure in Sabah, winning trophies and all that era. I mean, consider like the golden era of Sabah football. Yeah, and 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 if not mistaken, you know, I stand corrected on this, but I I think he has scored more goals than appearances. I think, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, really? Is it? Yeah, in, in when, when representing Sabah. I mean, wow. I, 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 I think so, but, but, but you know, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong here. But he has got a fantastic goal scoring record, and uh, and you know, very prolific in front of goal. Okay, and uh, you know, and but, but you know what, guys? Um, Actually, sir, Alvin, yeah, based on Wikipedia, he featured about 106 appearances and he scored 110. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so it was something, something like. A more goals to game ratio, which is uh, uh, amazing, and uh, and 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 the thing and the thing with him is uh, it was, I mean, you you guys can 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 continue to listen on and 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 understand and how he actually came into Malaysian football, and you'll be amazed, you know, how did he end up in Sabah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. So well, let's head straight into the interview then. Guys, uh, at the Bola Bola Show this week, we have none other than Mr. Scott Olorenzo, all the way from Kota Kinabalu, I presume. And uh, welcome to the Bola Bola Show, Scott. Thank you very much, guys. My pleasure to be here. Okay. Uh, we're going to start talking a little bit about your playing career with Sabah. You arrived in Malaysia back in 1994. I mean, how did that move actually came about? Yeah, at that stage, uh, in the early 1990s, there was a lot of Australians coming over to play in the Malaysian League. It had just turned uh, fully professional, and guys like Abbas Saad, Alistair Edwards, Alan Davidson, players of this calibre were coming over, and they were coming back, and they were raving about this place, which was called Malaysia. So uh, I wasn't so sure about my geography. So I had a look at this place and uh, it looked exciting and, and it looked great. And um, so a lot of us Aussies were also at that stage trying to come over because we were intrigued and uh, our curiosity got the better of us. So eventually my old Australian national team teammate, Alan Davidson, I kept harassing him and talking to him. He, and he eventually said, all right, all right, I'll get you a trial. So. He got me a trial at Pahang. And so I turn up down at Pahang, down in Kwantan, played a trial match, scored two goals, and was told after the game that they wouldn't be that they were not going to sign me. And I turned to Alan Davis and I said, gee, this is a pretty hard skill, isn't it? And he just said, Yeah, it is. So a um, couple of days later, I was in Malaysia at the time. So somebody put me on to a lovely man whose name was Leslie Armstrong. And Leslie, I got hold of his number, gave him a call. We started communicating. And a few days later, he said, I've got your trial at KL. Uh, and I said, okay, fantastic. So I went down to um, down to KL. At that stage, they were being coached by Ken Shaletta, the late Ken, Ken Shaletta, who actually later on down in Sabah became a very good friend of mine. I uh, turned up for the trial. Shebby Singh, I still remember Shebby Singh was actually playing in that game. Scored two goals. Shebby came up to me after the game and said, you did very well. You did very well. And I said, oh, you know, I said, thank you very, very much. And uh, Ken Chiletto came up to me, shook my hand and said, you did very well, but I don't need a striker. I actually need a centre-back. <laughs> and I looked at you. Wow, so, so, so Scott, so up to now, you have scored four goals in Peninsula Malaysia and still... These guys, we weren't good enough for these guys yet. Exactly, exactly. So I've scored four goals in two games. I can't get a club. 
and I fly back the next day with feeling very, very disillusioned back to Australia because I had my my actual commitments with my club, with my club, which was called Wollongong Wolves. I had to play for them on the Sunday. So I played a game on a Tuesday, a game on a Thursday. I've flown back on the Friday. I'm absolutely exhausted. Turn up uh, at the airport on a Sunday morning to fly down to Melbourne, played this game, was absolutely horrible, played really, really badly. I had no energy whatsoever. Then on the Monday, I get a phone call from Leslie Armstrong and he said, Sabba might want to sign you. Can you fly back? And I said to him, oh, my God, are you serious? He said, well, if you want to sign here, you have to come back. So I flew back on the Tuesday. My club in Australia weren't happy at all. Played on the Wednesday. Didn't play well at all. Didn't score. But Sabah said, no, we want to sign you. So they signed me. And as they say in the classics, the rest is history. <laughs> okay. Wow. Well, what a journey. What a journey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that was I think because I've been rejected by those two by by those two actual clubs, my record in Malaysia for the next four years was the best. My best goal scoring record was against Pahang and against KL. So I wonder why. Oh, so that, I guess there's some extra motivation. There. <laughs> extra motivation, yeah. I, I had a point to prove every time I played against those two those two clubs. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's talk about your success. Uh, what was it like to be part of Sabah Golden Era? Uh, Coincidentally, when you came to the to the to to, to Sabah, everybody managed to win the 1995 FA Cup and the following year the league title. I think the only thing missing was the Malaysia Cup. But nevertheless, uh, winning the league and the FA Cup is a tremendous uh, effort by itself for 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 club. Sabah. Yeah, I think I was extremely lucky to be honest because I think if I look back now. I arrived in Sabah just at the right time where the team was just about ready to have success. Um, and all they needed was one or two, one or two extra players coming in and they go against the best teams in Malaysia at that time. So I came in. Uh, and a defender by the name of Veselin Kovacevic came in at the back. Milo Mircesniger was already there. So the jigsaw puzzle was pretty much set, and us two coming in gave us that extra bit of something. And, um, you know, 94 was a decent year for us. We got to the final of the FA Cup that year as well, got beat. Um and then 95, on top of um, what I just said, then we had players like Yat Wai Lung, Ong Kim Sui, Kyle Asman as the goalkeeper. So suddenly we've, we've had uh, Ravi, Ravi Chandran as well. So we've had about four quality players from West Malaysia come in. Bala Chandran came in as well in 94. So those four or five quality players plus the foreigners that came in in 94, that just added that extra bit of quality. And it was exciting, you know. It was, it was exciting to play for a team that hadn't had that much success in the past and suddenly everybody was talking about football and the coffee shops were full of people talking about football. Pen and Punk Stadium, where we used to play, there was people hanging off the trees, you know, just, just to get in and watch the team play. So it was exciting. And then I, I met a striker who we hardly spoke off the pitch, but on the pitch, Matlin Margin and me, I don't know why, just for some reason we had this uh, special sort of special partnership and this communication and this understanding, but we hardly ever spoke. It was just something that happened naturally. And um, so for probably one and one and a quarter years was I played with a player who, I mean, if you look at his record, he scored two goals against England. So he was obviously a very high quality player. So that, that, that one and a quarter years that I played with Matt Margin was one of the highlights of my whole career. You know, it was fantastic. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, and and as mentioned earlier, you know, only the Malaysia Cup like that fell short for you guys. And uh, you know, in the 1996 final against uh, against Selangor, when, when you guys uh, lost, you know, what were your takeaways from that final? And I remember uh, the particular moment where you know. Uh, the Slango defender Talib Sulaiman was stepping up to take that winning penalty, and mm. you said you said something to him. Do you still remember what you told him? Yeah, I, I do actually. I still remember. As yeah. Walking past me. Yeah. I just said to him, "Don't miss, because if you miss, seventy thousand Slango fans are going to come after you." <laughs> <laughs> and I just kept walking, hoping. Obviously, obviously, I was playing mind game with him. Yeah. Uh, There's no pressure there. Um, but. Every credit to him. He handled the pressure, and he obviously didn't understand my my uh, Australian accent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, and, but and, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, the game itself. The game itself was as a spectacle. You know, it, it was obviously a nil or draw. I don't think I don't. You know, very occasionally a nil or draw can still be an enter- entertaining game. I think that was one of those games. It was an entertaining game. It was a very intense game. You yep. could feel the tension in the stadium. You know, it was it was one mistake and you're in trouble. Um, you know, personally, I was disappointed in the way I played because I didn't change the game. For me, as a foreigner in the big games, you have to do something where you actually change the game. Um, but in saying that, I was being marked by probably the best centre back that I ever played against, and that was Mehmet Djurakovic. So uh, he was a very difficult player to play against. He wasn't tall, but he was just so quick. Um, so you know, I probably got marked out of the game by him, and I was disappointed about that. But yeah, in the end, obviously, we lost on penalties. It was disappointing, and um, you know, but I wasn't one of these people to say, "Oh, we were unlucky. We played well." For me, we lost the game, and that was it. And we lost the game, and um, it was it's part of life, and you move on. Mm-hmm. Okay, and and you know that uh, if it wasn't for that infamous Max Fishing candle where several Sabah players were convicted, you know, mm. I mean, imagine if that whole team was together, how far do you think you you could have gone? Well, it's it's one of those, isn't it? What if? What if? What if? To be honest with you guys, I don't think about it that much because I think if I think about it that. If I think about what happened too much, it's a negative, and I don't like to think about negative things, you know. So um, to say I was heartbroken, it would be an understatement. To say, you know, even now it makes me feel sad because uh, some of those boys were fan- they were great lads and they were fantastic players, and they were guilty of making at ver- as very young men and very naive men they made decisions which uh, I'm sure they regret up till now. Um, so, yes, that team was a great team and we achieved something special in a short span of time. I prefer to talk about what happened after that. And for me, what happened after that was an absolute miracle to to lose six of your best players um, and then have a coach come in and that coach has to bring in basically kids, naive young kids who were still learning how to play football and to win the league in 96 for me is probably the greatest thing that I've ever been, I've, I've, I've ever, ever experienced. Uh, and I don't think that team because of the situation gets the credit that it deserves. So for me, that was even more impressive than, than the, the 1995 FA cup final. And on the positive side, uh, and also interestingly, you were part of the Slango selection side. That they played a friendly against the Manchester United, yes. and to be, it's, it's a very good, a very very good memory for me because that was my first match. I went with my father to watch. Um, so the fact <laughs> you ever scored a goal in a four-one loss, uh, what was what for you to be like, against in the likes of David Beckham? I think on a young age, how was it like? It was it was a great experience. I mean, thankfully, Ken Warden was the Selangor coach mm-hmm. at that time. And it was the Selangor team, but he got permission to bring in Alan Davidson and myself. So we had Mehmet Jurakovic, Joseph Joseph Biskic, David Mitchell, Alan Davidson, and myself. So five Aussies plus Selangor. 
uh, playing against Manchester U- United, the famous team. Um, and, you know, their team that night was a very, very strong team. Peter Smichael in goals. The back four was Parker, Bruce Pallister, Dennis Irwin. Midfield, Lee Sharp, David Beckham, Skulls, Butt, these type of players. Um, so it was a very strong team. And I remember in the first half, Steve Bruce and Paul Parker were complaining about mm-hmm. the heat. Um, I won't I won't say exactly what they were saying because there's there might be some young young people under the age of 18 <laughs> listening, but they weren't very complimentary. They weren't very complimentary um, about the humidity and yeah. the heat. And Steve Bruce and Parker kept on telling me, stop running, wee man. Stop running. I can't <laughs> breathe. I can't breathe. And in the first half, Davidson, Alan Davidson had the ball and I went to make a run across Bruce. And he didn't want to chase me. So he saw me coming and he got in front of me and he shoulder charged me. And I, I actually got winded. You know, when you get winded and you can't uh-huh. breathe, breathe. So... I had that in the, in the second half, the exact same thing happened. Uh, but this time I was actually ready for it. And he tried to block me again and he actually dropped his shoulder, but I sidestepped him and I sidestepped him. But I, when I sidestepped him, I went, my, my actual sidestep was towards the goal. So Davidson's played it over the top. And suddenly I can remember thinking as the ball's played over the top and the ball's bounced and, I'm, and I'm, can, I can remember thinking to myself, I'm in on goal here. I'm in on goal here against Manchester United and there's 60,000 people in the stadium and they're all screaming. Next thing I remember is this huge body. This huge body comes out and spreads his arms. <laughs> so the, at that stage... The, the great leader, baby. At that stage, the greatest <laughs> goalkeeper in the world has come out and I'm one-on-one against him. And there's a million, there's a million things going on in, inside your head, but you've only got a few seconds uh-huh. to make a decision yeah. what you want to do. So I just said to myself, don't, don't try and be smart. Don't try and be cute. Don't try and chip him. <laughs> don't try and go around him. Just hit it as hard as you can and get it on target. So I smashed it. At, I actually smashed it as hard as I could, and, and it went in the corner. So And then I ran off, and I had scored against Manchester United. So... <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's a good story to, to tell the grandkids in a few years' time, maybe. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So, you know, uh, uh, Scott, I'm sure you have lots of memories, you know, playing in the Malaysian League. So what are your, what are some of your fond memories? And uh, and what about defenders that you came across? Any that you still remember that's really hard to beat? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the local from the local defenders, I would have to say Gunalim. Mm-hmm. Gunnelin, he was at Selangor. Yeah. He had some fantastic battles. I, I, but you know what? He was a real gentleman. Mm-hmm. He would kick me. He would kick me like there's no tomorrow <laughs> and then come up and shake my hand and, and then say sorry. <laughs> and then two minutes later, I would get the ball. He would come and kick me. I would go two feet in, in the air and he'd come and say sorry again, <laughs> Scott. <laughs> so, so he was he was a difficult guy to get angry at because he was such a nice guy, but he was a very intense guy. I really enjoyed playing against him. Mm-hmm. The other two were obviously my two Aussie mates, Mehmet Jurakovic, who I've already spoken mm-hmm. about, yep. and of course, Alan Davidson. Mm-hmm. Uh, me and Alan are to this day very good friends. We speak at least once or at least once a week, sometimes twice. Wow. And okay. to play against him. Um, and do well against him, especially because he played for my favourite team, pa- Pahang. Um, <laughs> we had some, we we had some great, some great battles. But you know, to be fair, I'll, I'll never forget. I think it was the ninety, was it ninety five or ninety six Malaysia Cup semi final. Mm-hmm. Sabah against Pahang. The first leg was at Liquor Stadium. There's twenty five thousand people in the in the stadium. It was a very wet night. Teeming with rain, the pitch was a quagmire, very wet. Dollar Sale, from memory, scored for Pahang in the first half. Second half, 88th minute, we're at home, we get a penalty. I come up, I take the penalty, and I and I put it I put it over the top, so I've missed the penalty. Mm-hmm. And after the game, one of our fans somehow got onto the stadium and he tried to attack me. And you know, at, at oh. this stage, I was Golden Boot winner and top scorer in the league, but. That's the fickle. That's the fickle nature of the game, and I still remember to this day. Alan protected me, got in front of me just before this 
this um, so-called fan was about to do something and escorted me from the pitch into the dressing room. So even though we were at war, he was still a very good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Actually, I want to ask you, uh, do you have any regrets during your time as a Sabah player? But let me change the question. Uh, do you have any good, good memories in Sabah during your time as a player? Oh, I've got great memories and I've got, I've got, I mean, I think you always have, as a football player, you always have a few regrets. But, you know, obviously, I, for me, the, the great memories of those four years are much stronger than the regrets that I have. You know, I mean, for us to win the FA Cup and in 95, 96, we won the Premier League. Mm -hmm. But not just, and then what we did with the young kids when we lost our six players. Um, so, yeah, great memories. Big, 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 big games, you know, those games at the Shah Alam Stadium, you know, in front of 60,000, 80,000 people, all, the, those, all those home games that we played at um, our famous Liquor Stadium in front of 25, 30,000 people, the game against Negri Sembilan in 96 at Liquor Stadium where we won that to win the league. You know, there was some there was some big big games. My my regrets probably my only regret was that I didn't stay longer at, at Sabah. I had four years. I mean, six or seven years would have been nice, but in some ways, not long after I left Sabah, my body started to started to go bad on me um, in terms of my joints in my hip and my ankle, and I wasn't the same player that I was. So maybe it's good that that probably the best um, four years of my career was it Sabo and that I didn't stay before my form started to go down. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, it's wonderful to hear all these uh, amazing stories during your playing days because for all of us here, all three of us here grew up at that era. So it brings back, it's a very nostalgic yes. for us to be able to hear all these stories from you. Okay, guys, with that said, it's, it's all... nice to tell the stories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. yeah and, and 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 you know scott uh kudos to you your memory is really good i mean you remember like really pinpoint things man well <laughs> i guess dementia hasn't set in yet <laughs> but, but also, uh, 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 is it true that you've been called the ginger maradona i don't know jason dacey seemed to think that i was and i mean who's gonna argue with being compared to <laughs> For me, who was yeah. the greatest footballer ever in the history of the world? So uh, to be to be labelled as the Ginger Maradona, I think that that's a great honour. But I'm not sure if it's true or not. But if Jason Dacey says yes, then I'm going to stay with it. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. All right. <laughs> okay, guys. Uh, with that said, we will end this section of the uh, the, I mean, this segment of the podcast, and we'll be right back. <laughs> Right, guys, and uh, welcome back again to the Bola Bola Show. So, you know, uh, as we have heard Scott on his playing career, so now, now let's find out more about Scott, what Scott up to these days. So, you know, Scott, as we all know, Sabah has undergone a privatization process, you know, and now rebranded as Sabah FC, and you have been appointed as the team's technical director. So, would you care to share with our listeners what will be your prime role as a TD? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, firstly, uh, I just want to say how excited I was when I was first uh, approached because um, it's something that I wanted to do for a long time, but for whatever reasons, the opportunities just didn't come. So I was involved uh, when I retired. I wanted to get out of football for, for, uh, for a few years because I've been involved in football since the age of 17 at professional level. So I was involved with the actual coffee bean franchise for a few years and then an indoor soccer centre after that. But then the bug came again and I wanted to get back involved in football, but the opportunity to return to Sabah didn't come. So I did different, different things, uh, agency work, tours, my own Borneo Cup, and then the mixed heritage players came, came along and, you know, I was fortunate enough to be involved in those projects with guys like Brendan Gann and Corbin Ong, Matthew Davis, Junior, Junior Edistall, these type of players. Um, so, you know, I was always involved in 
in in in the game here, you know, basically throughout the whole country and at JDT as well. But uh, I was never really involved at my beloved Sabah, which is where I live. So when the opportunity came, I was really really happy. Um, my role uh, very diverse, I would say. Um, obviously, everybody wants to talk about the Sabah State team. Um, and that's where most of the attention is. So, but for me, we've got a, a fantastic coach who's been appointed. His name is Kerner Wong from Indonesia, and he will have my full support and I will help him however I can, but I will definitely won't be one of these people that interfere with him and the job that he is doing. So I'll be there for him however he wants but I definitely won't be overbearing and interfering. So I will have a role with the first team with the foreigners in terms of mentoring them and making them understand about the Sabah Hunt culture, about Sabah as a place, about the people, about the men, about the men, mentality of the people, uh, about the do's and don'ts as a foreign player, what's expected of them. For me, that's uh, very important. There's so many foreigners that turn up in this country and it's just a holiday for them. So I will be setting high standards for our foreign players and I'll expect them to put their heart and soul into this project and not just come here and pick up a check at the end of the month. So in terms of the first team, that's what I'll be doing. But then we go down to the 22s, President's Cup, Piala Bella 19s and then the 17s. I believe that it's very important that our program at least from the 17s, 19s, 22s into the first team is actually synchronised so that the Sabah way of playing is um, is synchronised right through our actual program from the under-17s onwards. Because at the end of the day, if an under-22 player gets called up into the, into, into the first team and the first team plays a completely different system to the under-22s, then we have a problem. So one of my jobs will be synchronising everything. And, you know, people, people talk about the way that we're going to actually play. You can't just come up with a culture and a methodology within a week or two. We need to do a study on everything within Sabah football. And then only after we do a case study. You know, we've got some... Um, strong boys in Sabah. And I'm talking about the you know, people from the Katazan tribe, the um, Dusian tribe, these sort of people, these are strong, strong boys. So what is our DNA? What do we stand for? And that's what a basic sort of study that I'll be doing this year so that by the end of this year, we can come up with the Sabah style of play and we can come up with what do we stand for? What is it that we believe in, in how we want to play? And once that's done, then that will be synchronised. For now, however the state first team plays, the 22s, 19s and 17s will, will be playing the same way. But within 12 months, we need to come up with our methodology and our culture and the Sabbath style of football. Um, then after that is the coaches for me. We've got some fantastic coaches here, guys like Julius Arting, Burhan, Aju, uh, and also Johnny Dom, Dominikus, my former teammates. Um, they need to go through the system and get their FIFA Pro so that when they're ready, they can coach the Sabah State team in the future. We've got a fantastic coach now, but we need Sabah Huns in the future. If they're good enough, they need to be qualified to coach in the future. The other guys, the guys that have got their level B, they need to get their level A. Guys that have got their level C need to get their level B. And all the way through, we need to get as many of our coaches qualified as possible. Um, and then there's the grassroots. I'll be working with the TD from Saba FA. And for me, NFDP have done a fantastic job. And we have, I think it's 13 centres of excellence in, in Sabah under the, the NFDP. But I still believe that our catchment area, in terms of the amount of players that play football in those campongs, in towns like Keniao and Runao, Tawau, Sundakan, just to name a few, 
There's a lot of kids that are in those campongs there that are not playing football regularly and not being taught the basic principles of football. So it's our job to find a way to start up junior leagues so these kids can have a chance to be actually, to actually play football and be taught to play football. And I truly believe that in the next three to four years, if we increase our actual catchment area, then the next Matlin Margins and James Wongs and uh, Hassan Sunnies can come. And then, like I've said for a long time, the sleeping giant of Malaysian football, which is Sabah, can make great, great strides. Okay. Uh, for the season 2020 Super League, uh, Sabah just barely managed to escape rele rele relegation by two points. Um, this is despite of the uh, 11 games they played because of the COVID pandemic. Uh, yeah. What will be the team objective for the upcoming season in 2021? Um, the objective is to make progress. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm, and I've spoken to our CEO, our team manager and our coach, and we're all on the same wavelength. Our objective is to make progress each season. So we're not going to come up with any big statements that we're going to win this, we're going to win, win that, because we live in the real world. I mean, for me, that's teams that come up before the season, and a lot of Malaysian teams are very guilty of this. They come up with these big, big statements before the season starts, mm -hmm. and then halfway through, through the season, they're in trouble and they sack the coach and there's instability you know, within the club. You ask me, in my opinion, what we need to achieve in terms of the state team is to improve on what we did last season. And if we improve every year, year after year, it won't be long before we're one of the top four teams in the country. But it's not going to happen in one year. It might happen in three or four years, but you need to improve every year. You need to remember that the current management only came in about six or seven weeks before the season started. Um, so it's not easy. You know, it's not easy. Um, they've inherited what they, what they inherited and we're trying to raise the standards as much as we can. Mm -hmm. um, but for now, if you ask me, stability is the key word for this season and then next season, a big improvement. Mm -hmm. And what will be uh, the, the main challenge within your role in helping Sabah to continue to achieve that objective? Um, for me, I, I don't think there's... I, I, if, if you say challenges, you know, for me, it's... it's um, we all, all want to raise the actual standards, and that's from the CEO to the team manager, the coach, the assistant coach, myself, down to the under-22s. It's not just about me. It's about everybody involved with the club. Every single day when we wake up, we need to think how we're going to improve things. Problem solving. We have a problem. How can we, how can we solve this problem? We have a player. Man management of our players. Um, but for me, it, it's, it's just so wonderful to have these um, sort of issues because that's what football is about. So, um, yes, it's a challenge. And, yes, there's always going to be pressure involved with, professional football but it's um it's a nice challenge if you know what i mean uh, there's nothing specific you know i mean the if you ask me this year what's the biggest challenge i would say COVID. i would say dealing with COVID, especially because of the geography of where Sabah is and the amount of traveling that we have to do uh, i just hope that the season can go on for the whole season without having stops and starts and then another outbreak and another MCO. That's probably going to be the biggest challenge for us. Mm -hmm. All right. And, uh, and Scott, as for the team's preparation for the coming season, you know, are you, ha are you happy with the overall recruitment or do you feel there's still room for improvement? Well, like I said, the team, um, the, the actual new management only came together six or seven weeks before the season. So we will we be better prepared in 12 months' time? Absolutely. But that's not making excuses. It is what it is. And our job now is with the limited preparation that we've had, with the limited recruitment that we've had time for, is to get the absolute maximum out of the squad that we that we have. And we believe we can do that. We believe we can form a team that's going to be competitive in the Super League this year. Um, 
But I guarantee you one thing, whatever happens this year, we'll be much better prepared next year. Okay. How about your playing philosophy? Uh, what sort of approach do you wish to see from Sabah FC? Is it an all-out defense or all-out attack? Yeah. Or is it in mix of well, like I said earlier, we're going to do a case study on the DNA, on every bit of Malaysian football, and we're going to come up with the Sabah style of, of play. But for now, I am not the coach. I'm the technical director. So I've explained what I, where I see my my actual job, but we've got a very, very capable young coach in Mr. Colonel Wong from Indonesia. So in my professional opinion, it would be disrespectful of me to say here how Sabah wants to play because that's his area. And I think the team is in very capable hands with him. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and of course, with the bulk of uh, Sabah's score having remained for almost five years, uh, how important it is towards the stability of the team? Yeah, very important. You know, very important. I mean, these players, they wouldn't still be at Sabah if they didn't have a future and we didn't believe that they were good players. So um, it's 100% true what you say. They've been together a long time. They know each other very, very well. Uh, they've become friends now, if you know what I mean. So they've become family. Um, and it's a bit like, it's a bit like, like I said, um, you know, when I first joined Sabah in 94, you just need an extra couple of players here and there, an extra bit of quality here and there. And, you know, professional football is a very fine line between success and failure. And you bring in one or two quality players. We're excited about the foreigners that we have coming. As I said earlier, I can't really divulge too much information about them yet. But we're hoping that the foreigners coming in uh, in combination with the local players that we've had who have been together, like you said, for the last five years, we're hoping that that will give us the opportunity to have a better season than we had last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Scott, you know, you did touch about this earlier a bit on the scouting network. So, you know, Sabah being such a huge state, you know, are you guys planning a proper scouting network to identify this potential pool of talent like for example you did mention about the junior league earlier yeah uh, absolutely and then, yeah, yeah and that's then, a great question that's a yeah. fantastic question and i think that's so important we need to set up what we would call a talent identification program mm -hmm. um and you know there's a lot of football mad people you know throughout the state and like you quite quite rightly said sab is a huge state it's a really huge state. And um, so we, one of probably, you asked a question earlier about the biggest challenge. That is probably the biggest challenge because we're such a big state. How mm -hmm. do we come up with a scouting program so that none of these talented players fall through and we don't, and we actually miss, and we actually end up missing out on, on them because, I mean, this is going to happen all over the world. You know, there's always players that, it could have been anything, but the scouting system failed. So yeah. that's going to be a massive challenge for Sabah FA, TD and myself and everyone involved that we, not only do we raise the amount of people playing, not only do we get the coaches um, that are coaching these kids with their license C, um, and not only do we set up a talent identification program, but the scouting of these kids, we've got to try and get that, uh, as professional and as high a standard as we can, so that kids don't fall don't fall through, and we don't miss out on the really quality ones. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that this whole plan will also involve uh, coaching education as well. Absolutely, yep. Mm -hmm. Coaching. What's the if if a uh, if a uh, say for example a ten year old boy is being coached by a coach who doesn't know how to teach the basic principles on how to pass the ball, how to control the ball, how to open up the body upon, upon receiving the ball, uh, how to strike the ball, how to dribble, you know, all these things that are learned at a very young age. If you're taught the wrong principles of football from a young age, there's a high probability that it's going to stay with you for the rest of your, for the rest of your life. Um, for example, I was never taught properly how to do a golf swing and I'm 53 and I've still got one of the worst swings in golf. <laughs> you know? 
you know what I mean? But if I had <laughs> been taught from a young age how to swing the golf club, you know, my, my handicap's about 12. But if I had a proper swing, my handicap could be three or four because I've got the power. So what you say is 100% right. We have to get those coaches, at least with their, with their licensee, so that the kids are taught the basic principles of football. Okay, okay. Uh, just, uh, just great to have all those insights, insights from Scott. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, it's been a, for me, I've, I've really enjoyed coming on the show. It's been nice to talk about the old days and of course about the more important part now, which is my job at Sabre FC. And uh, if you want me to come on in the, in the future, maybe halfway through the season or something, no problem whatsoever, guys. Okay. Oh, wow. That'd oh, be great. Man, that'd be, that'd great. be <laughs> Yeah, that'd, that'd be awesome, man. Yeah. Okay. All right, so, okay. so, to, so to end the podcast, normally what we'll do, we will have a little bit of fun. So what yep. we're going to do, Scott, we're going to ask you five very simple questions. You're just going to have yep. to answer, say, within the first five seconds, whatever comes to your mind. Yep. You, are we off for it? Yep. Okay. Okay. All well, right. Go, go ahead, Elvin. Okay, so Scott, you know, you're in Malaysia, so what's your favorite food? Chicken rice. Oh. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, since you're in Stava, what's your favorite drink? Beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then, okay, Scott, who's your favorite musician or artist? Leah Salonga from the Philippines. Oh, wow. okay. okay. Wow. I love Leah Salonga. I know everything about her. I'm a Leah Salonga groupie. Oh, oh wow. Okay, so okay. see, so you see, guys, you get to hear new things about Scott Olorenshaw. Wow. Yes. Uh, Miss Saigon. Miss Saigon. Yeah. Late, so you're into the music. You're into those musicals and all that. I love musicals. Yeah. Wow. Really love them. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. okay. Let's move on from music to your favorite movie. Favorite movie. Oh, that's easy. Forrest Gump. Mm. Oh, <laughs> wonderful choice. Wonderful choice. <laughs> and, and and lastly, which I, I think we might all get the answer correct on this, but we're going to hear it from you first. Favorite holiday destination. <laughs> Favorite holiday destinations. Um. I, well, I've never been to America, so I would I would have to say Thailand. Oh. Okay, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, I mean, what, what about in Sabah? I mean, any particular favorite place of you have in Sabah? Favorite, fav, what you mean, favorite holiday place? Yes, correct. Um, probably Dalit Bay, probably the Shangri La Rasa Ria is a beautiful ho hotel. I would recommend it to anyone. Mm. Okay, okay. And when you say favorite holiday destination, I can't say Sabah because I live here. Yeah, so, that's that's true, that, that's uh, basically your home. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. So, so guys, any last words, guys? No, I just want to thank thank you so much, Scott. It was a great fun having a chat yeah. with you, catching up with you. Yeah, thank you, and good Absolute luck, pleasure, good, good luck, good luck in your new, you know, uh, career now with the Sabah being the TD. Of the team. Yeah. I yeah. much appreciate yeah, right. Same from me too. Uh, good luck in your upcoming season. Uh, season. And uh, thanks for all the memories you've given to us. And uh, really Thank you. And good luck for your show. Can I ask, so when is, oh, sorry for my ignorance, when is the show on so I can start listening? Not just when I'm on, but when other people are on. <laughs> um, probably, in, I don't know, maybe next week, I guess. Yeah, right. for your for, for your episode, it should be it should be coming out next week. Uh, but but okay. you know there are lots of other episodes already out there, so you can have a listen as well. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. I'll have a listen. Yeah. Okay, and right. and of course and of course uh, from myself as well, Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. Wish you My all the best in your new role. And good luck to Sabah as well. Thank and, you, bro. Uh, and you have any message say for our listeners? You know because we might have some Sabah list uh, fans as well. Any message? Oh, just yeah for the Sabah Hunt fans, please. Please come back to the stadium and let's get that 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 famous liquor roar like we used to have of 20,000, 25,000 people in the stadium. It would be fantastic uh, for all those Sabahans, not just in Kota Kinabalu, but in all the other zones and towns. Come in on a Saturday and support the boys and watch the boys and let's uh, let's make Sabah proud once again. Okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm, okay, wonderful. Okay. So, with that said, we will end this episode of the Bola Bola Show, and thank you. Thank you.